He is risen. Good morning. And welcome to Radiant Christian Life Online. In a few moments, we're gonna begin our time of worship, followed by a message. And then after the message, we'll have some uh, important announcements we'd like to share. And then we'll close our time together this morning uh, with the worship song. But first, we wanna do something a little fun. We wanna do something uh, for the kids. Miss Angela has made a special lesson just for you. And so we're gonna let the grownups sit in and, and, and watch. And if you don't have any kids, this is an opportunity for you to sit back and see what God is doing in the lives of Radiant Kids. Enjoy. Good morning, kids, and happy Easter. Today is one of my favorite Christian holidays, next to Christmas, of course. You see, today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. But why is that so important? 1 Corinthians 15, 17 tells us, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You are still guilty of your sins. You see, Jesus had to die and come back three days later. But what does that all mean? Who is on this coin? That's right. This coin is going to represent you and all of us for the rest of this object lesson. I have some colored water, and this is going to represent our sin. Romans 3.23 tells us that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us have sinned. Not a single person on the face of this earth has not sinned, except Jesus, of course. The candle represents Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the light of the world. In John 8, 12, it says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to die for our sins. First Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. When Jesus was on the cross, he took our sins, just like it says in 1 Peter, that he died and removed our sins from us. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. And because of that, we are now forgiven. Just like this coin is no longer covered in sin, we are the same way. Jesus can take all of our sin and forgive it because he died for us. That's our lesson for today, kids. Thank you so much for joining us. Parents, you should be receiving an email with a YouTube link and a playlist of fun songs for your kids to sing in a short video. Now join us for morning worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Now your mercy has 
Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my My sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you call my name,
Good morning, Radiant. It's Easter Sunday morning, and it's so great to gather together uh, to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Uh, I know this is different than any Easter you've ever lived through, but that's just the reality of today. I, this pandemic seems to, to be dictating where we work from, or where our kids go to school, when we can buy groceries, and even what we can buy when we get there. And of course, how we celebrate this Easter celebration. You know, my first instinct when I think about that is, isn't it sad? And I know a lot of people have expressed this. Isn't it sad that this pandemic is now bigger than Easter? And, you know, I, you feel that and for a moment, but then you think, wait a minute, the resurrection of Christ is the greatest event in human history. And if that's true, then why does my life feel like the biggest thing that's happening, the biggest thing that's affecting my life is this pandemic? Why does it feel like our whole life is tied to the coronavirus. I mean, unfortunately, I feel like the coronavirus is defining our life, but it really shouldn't. See, you don't have to be a Christian on Easter Sunday to feel like this coronavirus pandemic is controlling life. Christians and non-Christians alike, we're all kind of in that same boat, feeling the, the strain and the stress of all the, the regulations and the, the limitations that are taking place right now. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're joining us today, I want to say thank you for joining us. This is a perfect time to be with us. It's Easter Sunday. This is, if you have questions about the faith, this is the Sunday to join us. We're so glad that you're here, and I trust that, that God has something for you. I, I really do. I, there are people in our church who are praying that you would leave this service and it would make a difference for you. But for all of us who feel like our life is being defined by our current circumstances. There is great news. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As you do, let me set up 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. It's actually a result of prior correspondence that we don't have copies of, but he found out that there were issues that were taking place in this church in ancient Greece that he helped to plant during his second missionary journey. Some of the issues he addresses are things like division and incest, the abuse of spiritual gifts to one-up one another, but he also addresses some doctrinal issues, things that um, were pretty significant as far as he was concerned. You see, there was a group in Corinth that were rejecting the idea of bodily resurrection, uh, the resurrection of believers. Paul saw this as a threat. It was an absolute threat to the very core of their faith. And so Paul mounts a defense for the bodily resurrection of believers. And he does this in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, but the, he opens up this chapter reminding them of the good news that he preached, the resurrection of Jesus. So he sets a foundation for his argument by saying, look, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day. Peter saw him. The 12 saw him. 500 people saw him. I even saw him. Many people who saw Jesus resurrected are still alive today, at least when Paul was writing this. So he reminds them of the foundational belief of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. He reminds them of that, and that's the foundation from which he makes his defense. Now, I know this may seem like 
while we're straying far from coronavirus, just stay with me. You're going to see there is great news with Paul's defense for us today. Turn with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have all said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we, are all, we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So Paul begins his defense by giving some hypothetical if-then statements. If dead men don't rise, then Christ did not rise. Now, if Christ did not rise, then the Christian faith is absolutely empty. Everything we believe. He says, our preaching, he and his associates, our preaching is lying. And your faith, well, it's useless. And then in verse 17, he takes these conclusions and makes another if-then statement by saying, if Christ had not been raised and, and your faith is useless, then you're still guilty of your sins. This must have been an absolutely shocking conclusion for the Corinthian believers. They probably hadn't considered that rejecting the bodily resurrection of believers would mean that they are rejecting everything about their faith. They probably weren't counting on finding themselves in the same position they were in lost in their sins before they ever heard about Jesus. But that's where they've brought themselves by rejecting bodily resurrection. That's, that's the conclusion that their line of thought was leading them to. Listen, Paul takes his final if-then statement and makes this point. If there is no bodily resurrection, then everything that we've been living for, all this whole Christian faith is just for this life, then we should be pitied more than anybody else because we are just deluded. It's a very strong statement. So in verses 20 through 23, Paul moves from these hypothetical statements to things that are certainties. He says, I am certain that Christ is risen from the dead, that he is the first. He set the template for more who will follow, that, that just as, as Adam brought death into this world, one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes from one man, Jesus. That everybody, all of humanity, we're, we're going to die because we're all belonging to Adam. But those who belong to Christ will be given new life. So the resurrection is the greatest event in human history. It's the greatest event because our sins are forgiven. It's the greatest event because it validates the things that took place on the cross a few days prior. These two go hand in hand. Paul writes in Romans, which is a different book, he writes this in 425. He says, he was handed over to die because of our sins, but he was raised to new life to make us right with God. See, Jesus' victory over death guarantees our victory over sin, and it secures our ultimate triumph in the end. It stands to reason that the greatest event ought to have the greatest impact on human history, and it has. But not just human history, it has had the greatest impact on how we live our life today. I know that seems like a crazy statement because it seems like the thing that's impacting our life the most today is this pandemic. But the greatest event has the greatest impact today. 
the way that it does is when we live our life with an understanding that as a result of what Christ did through the resurrection, that we get to experience a double resurrection. He was resurrected, and as a result of what he had accomplished for us, we get a double resurrection. We get the resurrection of believers, the, the very issue that Paul is addressing here with the Corinthian church, that at Christ's second coming, we will leave this broken world and live in a place where there is no virus, there's no suffering, no death, and no sin. And we wait for that resurrection. But until then, we're not left alone because there's another resurrection that we experience the very moment we place our faith in Jesus. We experience a uh, a resurrection moving from spiritual deadness to spiritual life. It's the, the symbolism of the Christian baptism that's seen in this. Romans chapter 6, Paul writes this about um, being buried with Christ. And, and we talk about baptism. We go under the water. It's like we are being buried with him. We have died to our old self. We have died. Our old life is gone. And we come out of the water like Jesus came out of the tomb to a new life, a life just like Jesus who was made alive by the Spirit. So we are made alive by the Spirit. And this new life that's, that's birthed out of the Spirit is what Jesus talks about in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 10, he goes, listen, I have come to bring life and to bring life that's abundant. It's a life where we live with a new heart, a changed mind, a peace that does not come from our circumstances and a strength that is drawn from something other than ourselves. We have been raised to an abundant life. For those who are in Christ, for those who have called upon him, we've experienced this resurrection, an abundant life. It's not dependent upon the circumstances of today. An abundant life is available no matter what the circumstances are. An abundant life is dependent on an event that happened 2,000 years ago, and that event is the resurrection of Christ. Let me say that again. Abundant life is not dependent on the circumstances of today. It's dependent on an event that happened 2,000 years ago, the resurrection of Christ. You see, we live in the middle. We live in between these two resurrections. We've experienced the first resurrection. If you are a Christian and you've put your trust in Jesus and he's brought you from spiritual death to life, you've, ex you've experienced that. We've not yet experienced this next resurrection because that comes when he returns. So we live in the middle. The first one gives us strength for today, no matter what the circumstances, that abundant life to live well in the midst of a pandemic or whatever life may have. And the second one gives us hope for tomorrow. See, living in the middle of these two resurrections means that, that you are living in the middle of God's work of redemption. You are living in the middle of God's work in you and through you. You are right where God is. He's given us abundant life that we can live well in the midst of our circumstances, but not just for us to live well, but that our life would bring him glory and that by bringing him glory, people would see him. God is working in you and through you. It's an abundant life, birth of the spirit, empowered by his spirit. Living an abundant life, it's not just dependent upon our circumstances. It's dependent on the event that happened 2,000 years ago. So how do we live that way? I know it's easier said than done. We could amen and we could say, that's right, Jerome, I, I agree. But yet I still wake up every morning and I look at the news and I find myself overwhelmed. The unknown of what's to come in the next few days and weeks is looming large. How do we live an abundant life if the circumstances aren't what dictates it? We remind ourselves, we get up and we remind ourselves what really brings about the abundant life, Christ's life in us. This is why we read scripture. This is why we pray. This is why we share our life with other Christians who could help us because it brings this truth to the forefront of our thinking. It brings this truth to a consciousness where we live our life with that awareness 
so that we don't allow our circumstances to define our life. It brings our life in alignment with God's plans for us and through us. Now, if you're not a Christian, I know I was speaking in this message mostly to Christians, those who have put their faith and hope in Him, those who have experienced this first resurrection, there is an abundant life that's available for you. And it comes when we put our trust in Jesus. The message of the gospel is that we are born into sin, separated from God because he is holy and righteous and we are so not. And to be made right with God, Jesus comes to earth, God's son, God in the flesh, fully man, fully God, the only one who could really be the, the go-between to represent man to God and God to man. He lives a life that we could not live and he died a death that our sins deserve. And by doing so, he has made us right with God because his righteousness, we get the credit for that. We could stand before God as if we are righteous because we are. It's not as if, we, we can stand before God because his righteousness is now our righteousness. We were once enemies with God, now we are friends. There's nothing that we can do to make us right with God. We can't earn it. We, and if we tried, we would never be able to earn it. And that's the point. All we need to do is cross the line of faith. All we need to do is call on him to rescue us, to say, yeah, I, I believe. And today, if you cross that line of faith, if you walked into this online meeting thinking about the possibility with questions or concerns and not quite sure what you believe and there's something stirring in your heart and you can sense. Listen, I'm convinced that God has been working in your heart well before you ever hit play. If you cross that line of faith today, I'd love for you to tell us. Reach out. Let us know at the church. Make a comment. Email me. It's jerome at radiantchristianlife.org. I'd love to be able to give you resources to help you grow and walk in these first few days of this new life. And there is a spiritual resurrection from death to life that takes place the moment you cross. I'm so glad that because of the resurrection, we can wake up tomorrow and live and live well, no matter what tomorrow may look like. May we remind ourselves, may we align ourselves with truth. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word to us because in your word, you've revealed yourself to us. You revealed your plan for us. It's a plan to rescue us. We've gathered today on Easter Sunday to celebrate this historic moment, but it's not just a historic moment, it's a life-changing moment, and it changes our life daily. May we walk in the abundant life that you have for us. As we celebrate the resurrection, may we walk in the power that that resurrection brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, while the message is over, it, we're not quite done. Uh, I want to share a few announcements with you, and uh, then we're going to close in a time of worship. I think it's really important at a time like this to be connected. We had a online communion service on Friday for Good Friday, and it was an incredible time where we got to greet one another, see each other over Zoom. And uh, I want to thank people who were there, but some people may not have even known about that because unless you get our church communication, you're not going to be able to, 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 to be in the know. And so it's important at a time like this when we can't gather that uh, you are signed up for our church email. You can do that by going to radiantchristianlife.church slash contact. Uh, we also have a Facebook page and Instagram that you can follow 
uh, you have to like the page. A lot of our information is communicated there as well as some other fun things. Uh, we do a weekly, uh, actually more than once a week, uh, lobby conversation so we can have an opportunity to interact uh, and be connected during this time when we are physically not together. I'd also uh, want to let you know about our text alerts. This is a way to, probably for me, the easiest way to get Jerome is to text him. So if you're like me, text is really effective. Uh, you want to send it, if you'd like to be signed up for this texting list, uh, send, a, send a text message with the word alert to 317-676-2040. I mentioned we had this Good Friday service, but other things are taking place and have been taking place while we haven't been together. Uh, this past Friday, for the third week in a row, Dinners on Us served meals to those in our community who are in need. And uh, just kind of awesome reading the, the testimonies and the, 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 the prayer requests that come out of the, the community that comes to our doorstep and is given a free meal. Uh, and I want to thank you for, for supporting that and being part of that. Uh, many of you have come, whether it was last week or the week before or the week before that, and, and been part of this ministry. It's just a way that we have to the ability to show the love of Christ in a time of need to people who are in need. Uh, we continue to collect for the, our Bridgewater outreach. You, you can make a drop off between 12 and four in the church lobby, and those items are being brought to the staff and the residents at Bridgewater. All of this ministry, despite all the challenges, only happens with your faithfulness. And can I say that you've been absolutely faithful I've, I've heard a lot of pastors share about the struggles that their church is facing without gathering together and having a physical uh, offering basket, but not us. We are actually uh, just a, a smidge ahead of our budget, and it's because of your faithfulness, giving despite not being here, giving because without a, without a basket. And um, can I just say thank you for your generosity in your faithfulness, you allow for this church to continue with the mission that God has given us. That the kingdom would expand in this community and around the world. Thank you, church. And listen, I know there's no basket today, but you can give online. Uh, if you text that same number, 317-676-2040, you can give, text the word give, and you'll get a, a link back with a, uh, you click that link and open up our giving page. Um, if you're not into giving online, you can always drop off a check. You could even put it in the mail. It'll get to us. Um, and many of you already have. So thank you, church. Now let's close this time. Uh, let's close this time in a time of worship as we reflect on what Jesus has done today. Would you worship with us? In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making. soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you and to your careful when I trust you I don't need to understand so make me your vessel In the pressing, you are making your wine. In the soil, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. You are breaking new ground. And where there is new wine. There is new power, there is new freedom. 
Jesus, bring me. 